Hi, I'm Jeff Todd, President and CEO of Prevent Blindness. Here at Prevent Blindness, we recognize July as Dry Eye Awareness Month. Here to discuss the topic with me today is Dr. April Jasper, an optometrist practicing in West Palm Beach, Florida, at the Advanced Eye Care Specialists. Welcome, Dr. Jasper. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so can you describe for us what dry eye is and some of the symptoms that someone may have? Absolutely. And I think it's important for people to know that I have dry eye disease as well. So not only am I a doctor who treats it, but I'm also a patient who experiences it. And I will tell you, Jeff, it's interesting because dry eye disease affects millions of people worldwide. It is one of the most common reasons that people come in for eye exams to all of their eye care providers. And, you know, so many diseases can be symptomatic or asymptomatic. Dry eye disease is definitely a symptomatic disease. And it actually can be very life-altering. And by that, I mean that people with dry eye disease that is not treated or continues to get worse, they may have difficulties that are so extreme that they have to have to change their job. They have to move to a different part of the country. They have to decrease medications. It can be very serious. So I love that we're having this conversation for all of our listeners. But what I would tell you, the symptoms that I see most often in practice and the things that people complain about the most and I experience as well include changes in vision, so blurry vision. And sometimes patients don't even know that their blurry vision is actually from dry eye. The other things they can experience are burning, even itching, so it can be confused with other conditions. And then interestingly enough, it is associated with sleep deprivation, reduced energy, and even just poor general health. So it's really important that patients are aware. Now, the other thing in the definition of dry eye disease is that there are two different types. And that's why it's so important that we have these conversations. One is when you don't produce enough tears, and that can be from some very serious conditions such as Sjogren's syndrome. But the other thing that can happen is that you just have too much evaporation of the tears. And so as we continue the conversation, I know we're gonna talk about that a little bit more, but I just want have, to have our listeners and viewers understand that the tear is has made up of layers. And this is the way I like to explain it to patients. Think of that water layer that's produced by the tear gland, which is up here under the lid, as that base layer. But then on top of that is a lipid layer, which is a little more oily. And the job of that lipid layer is to keep the tears from evaporating. So now we go back to what is it? It's either that you don't have enough tears or that they're evaporating too quickly. And there's many different reasons why that happens. Sometimes it's the medications we take. Oh, and this stat I think is incredible. You ready for this, Jeff? Yeah. All right, so of the top 100 medications, that people take in the United States, 22 of them have been known and proven to cause dry eye. So, I mean, you look at things like that and you go, well, people need their medicine and they do. So some of them are hypertensive, antihypertensive medications, antidepressants, uh, NSAIDs like ibuprofen, things like that. Those are medications that people need. So what we can't do is say, we're going to stop all your medications. What we have to do is figure out what's causing the dryness. How do we deal with it? What can we do to help patients? And then go from there. Yeah, you know, here at Prevent Blindness, we often talk about the intersection between eye health and overall health. And this is one more example of how some other, other thing, health conditions you may be experiencing are, are connected to your eye health. So yeah. what um, should a person do if they're experiencing some of the symptoms that you've described? You know, it's, it's normal for patients when they have eye problems or eye pain, eye symptoms, to look it up online and say, wow, what could this be? And I don't blame you. I do the same thing. But I think that the important thing here to remember is, as I said already, it can dry eye disease can be caused by some serious medical conditions. So the first thing you want to do is you want to go in and see your eye doctor and once you get in there to see the eye doctor, what they're going to do is they're going to ask you some very specific questions to try to determine what type of dry eye do you have, but also to make sure that's what it is, because sometimes it can be confused with other conditions. Once they go through that questioning and really have a conversation with you, which is what I love to do with my patients, I want to know, where are you having challenges? Is it when you're on Zoom calls? 
Is it when you're on your digital devices or is it all the time? So once we figure that out, then we actually do diagnostic testing. So we look to see what part of the problem we need to address first. Could it be that there isn't enough production of tears? How do we find that out? Or is it that there's some anatomical issues with the eye and maybe it's lifestyle changes that we can help our patients make? So that's the first thing. You wanna go in and see the doctor so we can help you figure out what exactly is going on and how can we help you and address this by the right treatment. Thank you for that. Um, are, are you seeing more cases of dry eye um, recently than, than previously? I would say absolutely, Jeff. I am seeing more dry eye than I've ever seen in the past. And so we used to tell uh, people that the prevalence, the um, number of patients with dry eye is between five and 50, five zero percent of the population. We're seeing that number much higher th today than ever before. And it also used to be that it would be patients like me, patients over 40, women, where we would see most of the dryness. And now we're seeing it even in children. And I, I would say most of the reason is because we're on digital devices more. And I'll explain that even in more depth as we uh, talk further. Yeah, and, and you mentioned the um, higher prevalence among women. Could you talk a little bit more about why that might be? So there's a couple of reasons why we see dry eye more often in women, and it's typically because of hormones. So hormone changes can cause a decrease in tear production but it can also cause a decrease in that lipid layer. And so that's one of the things we just know going into it that it is what it is. And knowing that, knowing that you're at higher risk, we want to definitely be careful about identifying it because that's the other thing. And I'm glad you asked that question. That's the thing we want to make sure of. We want to be certain that we help our patients to know that this is what's going on because the problem of dry eye disease as well is that it is not just a disease of today. When it's untreated, it can get worse over time. Got it. Um, you mentioned kind of different aspects of dry eye earlier. Uh, and one condition related to dry eye that I've only recently heard of is MGD. Can you yes. tell us a little bit about that and maybe um, tell us uh, what that stands for? Yes, so MGD stands for meibomian gland dysfunction. And I, I love explaining this because I don't think most people know that in the upper lid and in the lower lid are glands, they flow vertically. So the same way my hand is pointing, there are 25 to 50 in the upper lid, depends on those eyeballs. If you have big eyes like me, maybe more. In the lower lid, there are fewer. Now, these glands are responsible for secreting lipid. The lipid, how does it get into the tears? And remember, we talked at the beginning, the watery layer is on the base of the eye. The lipid layer is on top of it to keep those tears from evaporating. What happens, though, is when you blink, the lipid that is in the, those meibomian glands, the little muscles that are surrounding it help to push that lipid out every time you blink. So you have just the perfect combination of lipid to tears and to water. But here's where the problem begins. When we're on the computer, you can probably tell by looking at Jeff and I even now, but when we're on the computer, we don't blink as much. And so when we were outside playing, even when we were in school without devices, we would blink up to 16 times a minute. So blink, blink. Every time that blink action happens, we secrete that lipid into our tears so that the tears don't evaporate. With less blinking, we have less lipid secretion. And here's the other problem. When the lipid stops coming out of those glands, they can get blocked. And when they get blocked, they don't produce as much and they can actually die off. And so here's one of the other challenges of meibomian gland dysfunction is that a lot of people don't know they even have this until it gets worse. And so the problem again is we want to be able to identify it early. We know that it is estimated that 70% of Americans over the age of 60 have what we call MGD or meibomian gland dysfunction. We also know the prevalence goes up as we get older and we know that if we don't have the right amount of meibomian gland function, this is only going to get worse over time. So, so how do you treat um, MGD? 
So good question. Let me walk you through some of it. So one of the first things that I do when a patient comes in, I want to know how much damage has already been done. So we look at those glands. We look to see if there's damage that's already been done. And then we look at what can we do today to help you do better? So the first thing, and it'll be in any literature you look up, all of the scientific evidence says you want to keep those lids clean. And so makeup can that's left there for long periods of time can be a problem. Even just, you know, I'm in Florida, you work outside, you sweat, you know, you go have fun at the beach, you've got salt spray, you know, whatever it is you're doing, you want those glands to be clean so the lipid can come out of them. So the way I explain that to patients is, and I have them use lid cleansers, lid cleansers. so they so. do that twice a day. The other thing that's important is hot compresses. So when I see that people have mybobian gland dysfunction, what we have them do is use specially made hot compresses that they will put on the lids to heat that lipid and help it to come out. After they do the compresses, and that's twice a day as well, we have them massage those glands, helping that lipid to come out. If you do that twice a day, you keep those lids clean and use a specific type of artificial tear, preservative-free, something that's made specifically for patients that have lipid dysfunction or have this lipid deficiency, then what happens is we can help to be certain that you have those glands functioning correctly. So that's a starting point. But sometimes it's so advanced, this problem, that we actually need people to have heat treatments or IPL done in the office. And that we won't know until you come in, but those are some other treatments. Sometimes too, we really need to put people on oral antibiotics. There's a specific process or protocol we go through that will help to get those glands functioning as well. But the main thing is daily treatment by warm compresses, lid hygiene, and then the lid massage. Okay, so, uh, so um, are there certain groups that are higher risk for my bone gland dysfunction? So again, it can be influenced by medication. So I would say my and gland dysfunction is something that can be worse with people that are on certain medications. Some of the ones you want to think about, which it doesn't mean you don't need to take them, you just need to know. So you go to the doctor while you're on these medicines so we can watch for any problems and help to be able to treat you. But some of them are the cis-retinoic acids, which we used to know as Accutane. That's not a brand anymore, but you have isotretinoin or retinoic acid. Those are treatments for acne. And so that can be one of the medicines that's a problem. Some anti-glaucoma meds, we put people on drops and some of the drops that we put you on can have these effects as well. And so we want to know all of the different medications you're on. We want to know what your risk factors are. And then basically we want to help our patients to know they need to keep blinking. And believe it or not, we actually have people do blink exercises where I will tell patients, I want you to remember to blink put a little smiley face or an eyelash up on the computer screen that says blink and keep blinking while you work on your computer because that blinking action is so powerful. But that's that's really what we look at is people that have dry eye, we wanna know if it's aqueous deficient, meaning their tears are less, they're not making enough, or are they evaporating too fast? And then how can we help you to fix it? Well, I'm definitely gonna take that to heart. I spent too much time on Zoom, um, so I'm gonna try to, Increase by blink ratio there. Um, as we start to wind down, I guess I want to um, have one other question. We often, okay. one of the kind of misconceptions about dry eye is certainly if people hear about glaucoma or macular degeneration or retinal disease, there's this urgency about this. But I, I often right. hear with um, dry eye, oh, well, you can just go get drops and take care of that. Do you have any thoughts on how we can, yeah. can um, kind of better emphasize the importance of getting dry eye treated? Wow, I love the question, Jeff. And I, I feel it. I mean, seriously, as a patient, I know that the danger of people self-medicating, first of all, there's all kinds of products out there that are not safe for patients. I see home remedies that are listed, and there's been a lot of stuff in the news about drops that aren't safe and home remedies that can cause problems. I think awareness is important. What you're doing here is incredible. Letting patients know that it isn't just about go pick out any drop you want in the pharmacy and it'll work. That's absolutely not the case. And as a matter of fact, some of the drops you pick up in the pharmacy are not for this and will make you worse. 
And so I try to have that conversation every day with my patients. I try to put out social media uh, tips and, and things for patients. But really, it's, it's just about us helping each other, telling one person so that person can tell another person, getting the news out there, and, and parents telling patients, you know, their, their children, and knowing that it's not just a, a disease of this person that you see in the camera. It's no longer the woman over 40 years old. It's now everybody that's at risk because of everything we're doing on devices. And again, all the medicines we take. So definitely something we want to continue to share. As doctors, we try to share with all of our patients every day, even the ones that don't have symptoms. We want them to know that you may not feel it today, but if we see signs of it, we want you to be aware because it still could be a problem down the road. And once that cycle of problem begins, it's very difficult. It's more difficult to treat. Got it. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Jasper. Um, before we wrap up, do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to share? I love that, Jeff, you guys do such a great job of bringing these things to the awareness of, of patients. It's so good that, that uh, you have this out there for them. So thank you for that. But the other thing I would love to tell patients is if you have any type of eye symptoms, don't assume it's nothing. Go see your doctor. So important for them to help you and tell them exactly what you're experiencing. Make sure that you are honest with them and tell them what you're feeling. Tell them everything that you're using currently as uh, drops and, and home remedies. And then just make sure you're having your eyes checked yearly. The way I like to say it is make sure you check your eyes yearly because what we do today to help you with your vision is there is, is what we're going to do to help you have a lifetime of great vision. So Jeff, keep up the good work. I appreciate everything you guys do. I know my patients do as well. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much. And for anyone interested, you can visit preventblindness.org, type dry eye into the search button, and you'll find all sorts of information about this topic. Thanks again, Dr. Jasper. Thank you.